Hey everybody, it's Double M from the Touch Em Up podcast, and I've got some very exciting news. I'm thrilled to announce my partnership with BetStamp and Sign Up Expert. Now you may be wondering what that is, but this is opening up an incredible opportunity for you to join some of my favorite sports books in order to get the best odds and new user offers depending on the event. Head over to my dedicated sign-up page, which I've linked in the description, at signupexpert.com slash touchemup. This will allow you to explore a selection of sports books tailor-made to your specific region without you having to do any additional work. So without any further ado, if you're ready to support the Touch Em Up podcast just one step further and also catapult your sports betting experience at the same time, make sure to follow my sign-up expert link that's posted in the description of this video whenever you sign up to a new sports book. And without any further ado, let's get today's video started. All right, everybody, we're back this week with UFC 303, originally set to be McGregor versus Chandler. Now we have Yuri Prohaska versus Alex Pereira for the UFC Light Heavyweight Championship of the World. And in the co-main event, you have a somewhat short notice bout in the featherweight division between the number three ranked former Title challenger coming off of a third round arm triangle choke submission against the former interim champion Yair Rodriguez in Brian T. City Ortega taking on the man who has finished his last three opponents in the first round in the newcomer, the up and coming number 14 ranked Diego Lopez. So without any further ado, let's get this started and step into the ring. All right, guys, we are back for UFC 303. Again, it's not McGregor versus Chandler, but we have a really solid card. And I mean, even looking at this first fight up, this is a great fight. And I could waste time talking about last week how I had the bet lined up for Felipe Lima sub round 2-3. Go to put it in, and it locks me out right before the fight starts, so I wasn't able to place it. And then, of course, Felipe Lima gets a third round sub over Mohamed Naimov, you don't have to believe me in that case, just because I know some people, unless they see the ticket or whatever, they're not going to believe me, but I had it lined up and it didn't work, and then it all came down to Ikram Alaskarov getting a knockout or submission for me, and he got finished in the first round with that brutal uppercut from Robert the Reaper Whitaker, and it's funny because you look at the Hamzat Shemaev loss, which was his only loss in his professional career up to that point. And he got hit with an uppercut again. It was a different setup, but he just lowers his head, man. And it's funny because I tell people there's patterns in certain fighters. Like with Whitaker, 1-2 head kick, lead uppercut, cross, right head kick. A good jab and a good 1-2. And the, all those weapons are what finished uh, what finished Ikram Alaskarov. And then you see he got knock, gets knocked out viciously with an uppercut. In the Chimaev fight, and then you go in and you see him get knocked out with an uppercut again against a short-notice Whitaker. So, well, I guess Ikram was kind of on short notice as well. So, you know, it is what it is. But let's kick off the card with Ricky Simone versus Vinicius Oliveira in the bantamweight division. I think this fight is very, very competitive. I think that there's one side of this fight that's getting a little bit too much love, but I understand it in some regards. You know, Vinicius Oliveira... Coming on to the Contender Series, he was pretty highly hyped. He he was very a very highly touted prospect. Uh, very Anderson Silva-esque. Hands down low. Throws one-twos down the middle. Um, but the one thing we notice about Oliveira is he doesn't have the best takedown defense. And going up against the guy in Ricky Simone, he's going to push that wrestling pace. But he also has power in his hands. If you go back and you look at one of the last times we saw him fight a prospect, it was Jack Shore. And coincidentally, he won that fight against Jack Shore, and I picked Ricky Simone to win that fight as an underdog, but in this ma- in, in that matchup, he hurt him with the hands, with a big right hand, jumped on him, and then ended up locking up a submission and got the tap in the first round, I believe. It might have been the second. I think it was the first round, though. And yeah, you know, he lost against Song Yudong, got TKO'd, got dropped multiple times in that fight. He lost a decision against Mario Bautista. That's a guy I'm very high on. And I think Bautista is one of the best prospects in the division. And I think Bautista is a more well-rounded fighter than a guy like Oliveira. Um, The one thing I do worry about, like we already talked about, is the takedown defense. You know, is Simone going to be able to walk his way into range, pressure back 
Oliveira and not get hit with a big counter and end up getting taken down? Is he going to give up constant takedowns? You know, you look at the fight against Bernardo Sopai. That was a fight where I had Sopai as the underdog for one of my underdog picks of the week or my dog of the weeks. And it looked perfect. I mean, he got a bunch of takedowns, landed some good strikes, almost got a rear naked choke, flattened him out. I mean, he was having his way with him on the on the mat. And you think, well, if Sol Pai can do that, what makes you think Ricky Simone can't? And he definitely can. And that's what makes this fight so difficult. But I don't think that Vinicius Oliveira should be a 2-1 to underdog. In no realm of the imagination do I think Ricky Simone covers a 2.5 to 1, you know, 2 and a quarter to 1 favorite in this fight. I don't. Because we've seen durability issues with Simone. Even in places he survived, if you guys don't remember, he got knocked out in the first round against Uriah Faber. Got clipped with a big overhand and got finished. Vinicius Oliveira is long. He's tall. He uses his reach and range very well. He's going to be the longer fighter in there against Simone. Simone is going to have good body shots. He works good left hooks to the body, good left hooks up top, coming over the top with the right hand. But Simone's very stiff on the feet. Like, he puts his combinations together, but if you notice, he's a little stiff and rigid when he's closing the distance. I think anytime Simone stands and trades with Oliveira, he has the opportunity to land a bomb, but he also has the opportunity to get sparked. And if he's smart, he wrestles her early, he wrestles often, and he wrestles hard, and he constantly works takedowns, tires out Oliveira, and either gets a rear naked choke submission or a ground and pound TKO, probably late in the second round or in the third round. But I think Loke Dog is going to get the job done here. I like the underdog in Oliveira. I know he hasn't showed the best takedown defense, but I think he can get up. I think he can stuff the takedowns of Simone, and I think the power and the awkward angles that his punches and kicks and knees come at are going to give Simone some trouble because we've seen him get hurt so many times. Even in the fight against Mario Bautista, he didn't get dropped, but he was getting wrecked, you know, the longer that that fight went. And I think everybody's expecting Simone to have like this great cardio and he's going to push the pace hard for 15 minutes unless he gets every takedown that he wants and concedes, and I'm sorry, and Vinicius concedes a lot of control time, I don't even think Ricky Simone's going to have the best cardio in the second half of the second round and into the third round, and I could see a late finish from Vinicius Oliveira as well. I'm going with Oliveira. I like his striking. His one is very clean. He moves his head well. Well, he doesn't move his head well, but he moves well. He uses angles, good counters, can land big, you know, fight-changing shots. And I think that's the biggest difference here is even if we go to the judges' scorecards, I think it's going to be the takedowns and control time of Simone versus the bigger moments and the damage from Oliveira. So I'm going with Loke Dog. I'm going with Vinicius Oliveira. I think he gets the job done. I'm going to go with out on a limb here and say he finishes Ricky Simone. Uh, I got Oliveira, second round TKO. I think he lands a big right hand and then times a level change with a big knee. I don't think it's going to be a flying knee. But I think he times one of those level changes with a knee, hurts Simone, jumps on him, and gets him out of there. I'm going with Loke Dog in his second fight in the UFC, technically third if you count the Contender Series, via second round knockout due to a level change knee against Ricky Simone. All right, the next fight up we're going to break down is in the flyweight division, and it is against the road to UFC winner in Ray Soruya, taking on Carlos Hernandez, 9-0. For Saruya with his UFC debut, taking on Hernandez, who is 9-3. and three. Um, I I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this fight. I, I like Ray Saruya here. Carlos Hernandez has a good jab. He uses good one-twos. He uses good movement. He has decent wrestling, but he doesn't have the best jiu-jitsu. And it's mainly just good offensive wrestling. He doesn't have the best defensive wrestling. He did beat Dennis Bondar. He looked very good in that fight. But I think after that fight, we kind of realized that Bondar isn't really UFC level. And we don't know if Saruya is UFC level. But let me tell you, what I've seen from this guy on tape, his timing on the level change, his ferociousness and aggressiveness with the takedowns, his ability to change positions once he hits the mat from side control, half guard, full mount, take the back. I mean, it's the minute you hit the mat, you're in danger. There, there's no real you know, waiting it out, trying to get you tired. He's going for submissions the minute you hit the mat. And he's not afraid to strike on the feet. He'll switch between southpaw and orthodox. He throws good straight punches down the middle. You know, we saw Carlos Hernandez go up against Tatsuro Tyra, and Tyra's not even known as a striker, and he knocks him out. 
you know, technically could have got a submission in that fight, but hurt him with a right hand, and once he was hurt, that was it. He tried to survive, and he couldn't. I could see a similar situation here where Saruya hurts him on the feet, which allows for the level change or allows for a front headlock to a guillotine or something like that. I mean, this guy went for an executioner submission, which is pretty much a reverse guillotine choke from the back. If you've ever watched WWE, you know my channel. It was basically a dragon sleeper. Look up the dragon sleeper. That's what he had his road to UFC opponent in, a dragon sleeper. And it was vicious and it was nasty. Um, and I think Saruya is going to shine here. I think Saruya finish this, finishes this fight under two and a half rounds. I don't think this fight goes the distance. Uh, I like Saruya by submission. I like Saruya inside the distance. And I like the under two and a half. Saruya to win in rounds one and round two. I think that's also live. Um, could be a ground and pound TKO. Could be a submission. That's why I think inside the distance might be a safer play. Or, you know, Saruya round one, round two. But I think this guy is going to get the takedowns. I think he's going to transition. I think he's going to slice through Hernandez like butter. I don't think Hernandez is a bad fighter. Dude, don't get me wrong. I don't think Carlos Hernandez is a bad fighter. I think he has good boxing, good movement. He uses great footwork, great ability to cut angles. But I think the wrestling and jiu-jitsu of Saruya is, is on another level. And we can obviously be proven wrong. You know, a lot of these guys that have been in the UFC for a little bit, going up against these newcomers when they come off the Contender Series or they come off the road to UFC, they tend to not have a lot of success, you know, for the most part. But I think that this guy's different, and I think this guy is going to change that story. So give me Ray Saruya to defeat Carlos Hernandez via a first-round rear naked choke submission. Uh, I think he finds the back, gets a choke. Could be a bunch of different submissions. But I like Saruya first round sub against Hernandez. And I think this kid's the real deal. And you, you'll be in for a treat watching this guy compete on Saturday. But yeah, give me Ray Saruya first round submission over Carlos Hernandez. All right, next fight up on the prelims is a fight in the bantamweight division against a man I was very high on in his last fight and very high on pre-fight in Peyton Talbot. Sean O'Malley 2.0 or Peyton Talbot version 1. Going up against Giannis Gomori. Gomori 12 and 2. Peyton Talbot undefeated at 8 wins and no losses. Um, Talbot looked sensational against Cameron Simon. And he looked really good on the contender series as well. He just showcased some issues with grappling, um, getting taken down. But, you know, he, he shored that up a little bit against Nicky Geary. He was able to. Uh, get, he got taken down, got put in bad positions early, but then Aguirre tired out. He started beating him up on the feet and then eventually submitted the man who was known to win by submission. And, and in the Cameron Simon, Simon fight, like we said, I mean, brutal uh, catching a body kick and spinning into a wheel kick, timing a level change with a, with a knee right up the middle that sounded like it cracked the skull or cracked the clavicle of Cameron Simon. And then catching him in round two with a beautiful left hook on the counter, dropping him and finishing him. That was a fight where I played Peyton Talbot to win by second or third round TKO. I think it was at plus 750. You're not going to get those numbers now. Um, but I do like the round two, round three TKO for Peyton Talbot. I think Giannis Gamori, the style of fighter that Gamori is, he could get whitewashed and get destroyed in the first round. But I think he's also going to be patient enough. To the point where he's going to allow Talbot to work. He's going to get hit. He's going to get hurt. But I think he's durable enough to at least survive the first round. And I think Talbot comes in. And I think Talbot finally just kind of starts to slow cook him. He moves around. He gets his bait. Boom. Jab. One, two. Low kick. Bop, bop, bop. Body kick. Spinning back kick to the head. Moving around. Cross hook. Counter with the hook. Uppercut. Switch stance. He's going to just kind of be picking him apart. Kind of baking his cake in the oven, baking those muffins, just pop, 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 pop. And I think he's going to start to pour it on in the second round. I think Amori is tough enough to last throughout the first round, but I also think he's a sacrificial lamb, and I think Peyton Talbot is going to get another sensational finish. He could get a submission, so if you want to play inside the distance, that's fine, but Peyton Talbot's like a 20 to 1 favorite. I think the best option is to go back to the well with what we did with the last fight. And play second and third round TKO. If you want to get like more specific than that, uh, Peyton Talbot wins in round two. Because I don't think it makes it to the third. So Peyton Talbot wins in round two. Peyton Talbot wins in round three. You know, play those how you will. But I think this kid's the real deal. We obviously haven't seen him fight 
the upper echelon of competition, but Cameron Simon isn't a, isn't a bum. You know, Simon's very good, and I think Peyton Talbot, you know, winning that fight in the way that he did, it shows how good this kid can be. So, I like Talbot, I like his striking, I like his movement, I like his finesse, I like how loose he is inside the cage and the flow state that he gets into, and I think he's going to beat the brakes off of Gamori in the second half of the fight. So, I like Peyton Talbot, second round TKO over Giannis Gamori. I mean, there's not much else to say about it, but... Talbot KO 2-3, baby. That's the way we're going. All right, and we've got another interesting fight here in the featherweight division between Charles Air Jordan taking on Gene Silva. 12-2 for Silva, 15-7-1 for Jordan. Uh, I'm going to be honest, man. I think this is a tricky fight. You know, in certain regards, I think everybody sees the UFC experience. 2023 and 2024 is the years of... UFC experience. Mainly 2024, because a lot of veterans are beating these up-and-comers. This could be another one where Jordan, you know, gives a vet lesson, because he's been in the UFC for a long time, to Gene Silva. But Jordan is not a guy who's been supremely successful in his UFC career, and I think that's really where you have to draw the line. Um, I, I see a lot of love on Jordan. I like Jordan. I like Jordan's movement. I like his footwork. I like his left kick to the body, the left head kicks. He really whips those kicks very well. He's very crisp, very clean, good teep kicks. You know, everything Jordan does is very crisp and clean. He's a very good technical striker. And he can turn up the he can turn up the heat. You know, he can put on the pressure. He can go long. You know, he can go 15 minutes. But I think Gene Silva is a little bit different. I think the power difference is going to be the biggest thing here. And if you go back and you watch uh, Nathaniel Wood versus Charles Jourdain. The biggest difference in that fight was number one, the takedowns and then the trips, but it was the power of Nathaniel Wood. You know, every time Wood kind of landed on Jourdain, he hurt him or like stumbled him and wobbled him. And then he ended up giving up the takedowns because he wasn't able to, you know, get his senses back quick enough to be able to defend them. Now he survived. That was a fight where I backed Nathaniel Wood by decision in a parlay that ended up uh, being $10 for like 780, it was like over two and a half in Gan and Tuivasa. Nathaniel Wood by decision. I think Abus Maga made off by knockout against Dustin Stoltzfus and like something else that was crazy. But besides the point, let's get back to the fight that we're looking at. Jordan is good. He has good submissions. We've seen him lock up guillotine chokes. You know, he can threaten with submissions if Gene Silva goes for a sloppy takedown. Um, we don't know much about Gene Silva. We saw him knock out Weston Wilson. Wilson comes back, wins against Jekka Sarigi, which I said before the fight, like the craziest thing would be, you know, 2024 MMA logic says Weston Wilson wins that fight by submission and he almost gets knocked out and then he gets, you know, the submission win and ruined a lot of people's nights, you know, for the most part, except the people who bet on Wilson. I know some of the MMA community was on Wilson, but in this fight, man, I just don't have enough faith in Jordan to back him against a guy who I think is patient, throws good combinations, you know, finds his openings very well, and has a lot of power, and that's Gene Silva. I think Silva could get in some trouble with submissions, but I don't think Jordan has good offensive wrestling, and I think it's going to be more of maybe Silva shoots a bad takedown, gets his neck caught, and gets guillotined. Um, I think that's a possibility. He always threatens with that guillotine. He did it against Ricardo Hamos. Um, you know, I think that there is a possibility that Jordan wins by submission. I think there's a possibility Jordan wins, you know, by decision, by just putting too much volume down the stretch. But I really think the power of Gene Silva and just the relaxed demeanor that he has and the ability to find the shots, the ability to land that big power, I think that's going to make the difference. Um, I think Jordan gets finished here. I think it's with body shots. I think it's with work to the body after hitting him up top. But uh, I like Gene Silva, man. I like the underdog here. I can understand why you're on Charles Jordan. You know, it makes sense. UFC experience, um, decent cardio, good output, you know. But the guy gets hit. The guy's very inconsistent in his UFC career. Win one, lose one. Win one, lose one. Lose two, win one. And I'm not going to back a guy with that level of inconsistency, even though he has the UFC experience. I like Jordan as a fighter. I, like I said, I think he's technically good. But I, I, I have a little bit more faith in Gene Silva with the power, 
the calm demeanor, the ability to find the shots on the feet, find the openings, and land those bigger, more fight-changing shots. I like Gene Silva. I'm going to go Gene Silva, second-round body shot TKO against Charles Jordan. Would not surprise me if it goes decision, but I like the dog in Silva here. So give me Silva, second-round TKO. And we got a battle of MMA veterans here. Cub Swanson versus Andre Touchy Feely. Man, this is a fight that's just going to be fun. You know, I'm excited for this fight. I think this is going to be a good fight for as long as it lasts. Um, I wouldn't think there is going to be a finish. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if it goes decision, I'll say. But I do think this fight probably finishes inside the distance. Um, we know what we're getting with Cub Swanson. He got a robbery win against Hakeem Dawadu in his last fight. And, you know, it is what it is. He wins that fight. He shouldn't have won that fight. He got outstruck. He got outpointed. And I think Dawadu clearly won. But, you know, you can think what you want. Andre Feely knocks, gets knocked out by Danny Ige. That was a fight where I picked Feely by decision. But before the fight, right before the fight started, I ended up betting Ige KO round one, round two. I think it was plus 600, something like that. And, uh, you know, he caught him right over the jab with the right hand and knocked him out in the first round. Feely is very good. He puts his combinations together. We saw him knock out Lucas Almeida, and we saw how good Lucas Almeida just looked against Timothy Kwamba. So, you know, you got to take everything with the last performances, and Lucas Almeida came back and looked good after a rough patch. So, Andre Feely, that knockout looks better now. You know, he and it, it was really a case of whoever landed first. You know, I think if Feely would have got hit first by Almeida, he would have got knocked out, but Feely landed that right hand first and knocked him out. And it is what it is. Feely uses good one-twos. He's got a good left hook. Um, he's always trying to get that outside foot. Moves very well. Good low kicks, good body kicks. Um, I think the speed advantage is definitely on the side of Andre Feely in this fight. I think he's faster. I think he puts his combinations together better. But again, I think there's a big power difference where I think Cub Swanson has a lot more power than Andre Feely. Feely's coming in off a knockout loss. You know, we don't know how he's going to look. And he's never been the most durable guy. We saw him get knocked out by Yair Rodriguez. Um, we saw him get knocked out by Dan Ige. We saw him get knocked out in the first round by Joey Anderson Brito. You know, this guy is a guy who can get the lights shut off and get the lights shut off quick, and you kind of have to catch him cold. Cub Swanson is getting older, but he still looks decent. He has the better boxing in this in this fight. I think the better kicks would probably go to Feely, um, even though Cub Swanson can go with wheel kicks or spinning kicks. Um, I, I really think this fight is basically a case of, you know, who shows up better on the night. And that's fighting in general, but I think this fight is, it's going to go one of two ways. Feely's going to be too fast for Swanson. He's going to be landing too much volume. Swanson's going to survive, but he'll get picked apart for 15 minutes and lose a decision. Or Swanson lands the bigger shots, hurts Andre Feely, has the bigger moments, maybe wins a decision, or wins by TKO because he has that boxing ability Big overhand right, big left hook, big uppercuts can really just put it on you and hurt you uh, very bad for, you know, the length of the fight. Um, and Swanson has the better wins, man. Swanson has a knockout over Ch Charles Oliveira, and he's got a win via submission, I believe, over Dustin Poirier. So beating guys like Dustin Poirier and Charles Oliveira, that, that's definitely something to take into consideration. Yes, it was younger versions of Oliveira. Yes, it was a younger version of Dustin Poirier, but he still has those wins, man, and you got to take that into consideration. Feely's never really had that big signature win. I would say probably the best win of his career is that knockout win over Lucas Almeida. I like Feely. I really like the way Feely moves. I like the way he switches stances, um, finishes combinations with head kicks, but I, I think this fight is a coin flip. Um, I'm going to go with Cub Swanson. I'm going to go with Cub Swanson because I think Swanson has the higher finishing equity in this fight. He has the higher probability to get a finish and to have the bigger moments. And with Feely coming off a knockout in his last fight and a knockout in the first round, yes, it was against Dan Ige, who's one of the most powerful punchers in that division, but you also have to think, when's the last time we saw Ige get a KO? He should have got a KO against Nate Landor, but Landor survived. Um, he knocked out Damon Jackson, who's not necessarily the most durable guy. And he knocked out Feely. So we know the durability is a question. Um, Ige knocked out Gavin Tucker. You know, he has KOs, but a lot of the times Ige is going to decision. Um, I think Swanson and Feely go back and forth until Swanson finds one of those big shots. 
a big overhand right, a big hook. That hurts Feely, and Feely can't recover, and he gets him out of there. So I'm going to go killer Cub Swanson. I think he's like a plus 200 underdog to defeat Andre Touchy Feely via a second round knockout in this fight. I think the power of Swanson is going to be the biggest difference here. And like I said, coming off a KO loss, I, I don't love it. And an early KO loss at that. So Cub Swanson, second round KO over Andre Feely. Um, this is going to be a good fight, and it's definitely one for the MMA purist, so to speak. Up next, we have a battle in the middleweight division between Body Bags Joe Pfeiffer taking on Mark Andre Berriot. Man, this is a good fight, you know, but I think this is a pretty winnable fight for Joe Pfeiffer. I think they want to get him back on track after the decision loss as a big favorite against Jack Hermanson. You know, he didn't just lose the fight because he got taken down. He lost the fight because he got outstruck. You know, but Jack Hermanson also outstruck Chris Curtis as well. And we thought that was another fight where Hermanson was going to get outstruck on the feet. The the movement, the the jabs, the low kicks, the one-twos, the front kicks to the body. He just throws a lot of volume at you and doesn't allow you to really get into your rhythm and get into your groove. And that's kind of what happened with Pfeiffer. You know, when he slowed down the longer that the fight went. Mark andre Berriot's a guy who is going to put that pace on you. He's going to put that pressure on you. He's going to put his jab in your face, one-twos, you know, look to work the body and look to really just drown you under the pace and under the pressure. But he leaves himself open for counters and leaves himself open to get hit. He's not ever been the best defensive fighter, and I think that's going to cost him here against Joe Pfeiffer. I think Pfeiffer comes into this fight and knocks out Mark andre Berriot in the first round. I think when we get to the midpoint of the second and into the third round that there definitely is a chance that Andre Berriot, you know, survives, starts to put that volume on Pfeiffer, kind of breaks him down the stretch, and maybe gets a third round TKO, maybe gets a third round uh, submission. I think it's possible that he finishes him late and breaks him, but Pfeiffer showcased pretty good cardio against Hermanson for the first few rounds, so I think he'd be able to survive, even though the volume and pressure of Burial is a little bit different, but he's not as heavy on the pressure as he used to be, and maybe it's because he's been knocked out before and been knocked out a couple times, but we don't really know. But I think Pfeiffer can also grapple. You know, he can get takedowns. We saw him get an arm triangle submission against Abdul Razak El Hassan. That was a fight where I picked Pfeiffer by submission. I think Pfeiffer by sub by itself was 16 to 1. Pfeiffer by sub in round 2 was like plus 2,000 or something like that. So um, I like Pfeiffer. I think Pfeiffer is going to find that signature knockout. I think they're going to get him back on track. But it's a live betting spot for Marc-Andre Berriolt. If Berriolt survives the first round and a half, but he's getting pieced up, getting dominated, maybe he gets dropped and wobbled and survives... Then you live bet Burial, but you can't pre-fight Burial because I just don't think that's the right decision. I think this is a very winnable fight for Joe Pfeiffer. I think Pfeiffer knows that. I think the UFC knows that. And I think Pfeiffer's going to get a KO in the first round. I think he's going to catch Mark andre cold, hurt him, and knock him out. We saw him get submitted by um, Anthony Fluffy Hernandez with uh, MAB. But, you know, that's happened to everybody who fights Anthony Fluffy Hernandez for the most part. There's only been a select few who've gotten TKO'd um, as opposed to the submission. So I'm not going to hold that against Barry Alt. I do think Barry Alt's going to have the better cardio in round three. And if he survives, it could be interesting. That's why I think it's a live bet. It's either a live bet Barry Alt or Barry Alt wins in round three. Um, but I think Pfeiffer is going to be too crisp and too powerful for Mark andre And I think he's going to knock him out in the first round. I'm going Joe Pfeiffer. First round knockout over Mark andre Barry Alt. If you're going to bet it, Pfeiffer KO 1-2. Pfeiffer KO or Mark andre Barry Alt to win in round three. You know, I, I think those are the best ways to look at it from both sides. But I like the Pfeiffer side. I think Pfeiffer finds the chin of Barry Alt and knocks him out in the first round. So Joe body bags Pfeiffer to defeat Mark andre Barry Alt via first round knockout. All right, and now we're on the main card with a battle in the welterweight division, which I'm kind of surprised that this isn't the featured bout. But I think opening up the card with this is a decent idea. We have a battle between the undefeated Ian Machado Gary taking on the newcomer to the UFC who got a win via decision over Kevin Holland in his last fight in the former Bellator standout in Michael Venom Page. Listen, Michael Venom Page and Ian Gary, um, Ian Gary's a guy that we know how he's going to fight. He's sharp. He's clean. He has good counters. Really solid boxing, decent body work, you know, 
he, he's a very well-rounded fighter. He can wrestle, he can go for submissions, and I think in this fight against Michael Venom Page, using the wrestling would be a good idea. We've seen MVP get knocked out before. He got taken off his feet with a low kick and then hit with a vicious uppercut by Douglas Lima and got knocked out cold. And, you know, could Ian Gary knock out Michael Page? Yes, he could. But I honestly think the speed and the just awkwardness of Michael Venom Page is going to give Ian Gary some trouble. I really do. Now, Ian Gary came in and he won that fight against Jeff Neal. And that was one that I did not think he was going to win. You know, he got clipped with some decent shots, but the front kicks, you know, timing the knees, the knees to the body, the knees to the head, um, front kicks to the body, using his jab and just constantly fighting on the outside... That was a very solid game plan, and he won that fight. And in this fight, I think everybody's expecting this to be like a, a all-out war, and it's going to be a great fight. I honestly think this fight's going to be kind of boring. And if it's not boring, I think it's because MVP catches uh, Ian Machado Gary with a counter and knocks him out. I, I would venture to say that if there's a finish in this fight, it's either a submission from the side of Ian Gary or a knockout on the side of Michael Venom Page. Even though we've seen MVP get KO'd before... I don't think Ian Gary's the type of guy that's going to knock out an MVP. Um, I think the side stance leaves himself open for low kicks, but he times those low kicks very well and can, you know, run right down the middle with that straight right hand, darting in, just a darting in right hand, kind of like a Wonder Boy. And Ian Gary has, you know, the same counters as well. He throws a lot of low kicks, but he has good pull counters. So as if he's not quick enough, MVP can throw that right hand. Maybe he pulls it and counters back with his own right hand over the top. Um, I wouldn't be surprised because, like I said, Gary has very good pull counters. If you go back and watch the fight against Song Kanan, he got dropped early. But then later on in the fight, he ripped the left hook to the body. Expected the left hook to come back on the counter from Kanan. It did. He pulled back, came back, right hand, left hook, uppercut, and, and mixed it together. The guy's got very good ability to pull counter. And I think the pull counters can work against MVP. But I do think MVP is going to be a lot faster. You know, Kevin Holland was the perfect type of opponent for MVP to showcase his counter striking against because Kevin Holland doesn't really move that much. He moves in and out a little bit, but he's pretty much a stationary target and he doesn't move his head off the center. So he was there to get clipped with spinning elbows, right hands down the middle, uh, one twos, body kicks, low kicks. I mean, everything that MVP threw at him, he kind of got clipped with, you know? And he got hit with some low kicks. He did get taken down and get put into some bad positions. And I really think Gary would would be wise to use his wrestling in this fight and, and get in the top position and look to get, you know, off some ground and pound. Look to get the back of MVP and go for a sub. Flatten out the back. Ground and pound. Like, the grappling is where Ian Gary is going to have the biggest advantage. But I kind of think he's going to want to play the striking game. And I think if Ian Gary wins a striking match, it's probably a boring decision. If MVP wins in a striking match, it's either a boring decision where he lands the, the cleaner counters or he knocks out Ian Gary. I, I definitely think MVP is live to catch Ian Gary on the chin with that darting right hand. You know, catch him with a head kick. Catch him with a spinning elbow as he comes into range. But Ian Gary's very smart. Listen, I don't like the guy. I just do not like the guy. He he rubs me the wrong way in every way possible. But that's kind of his job at this point. He's basically a heel in professional wrestling terms. And that's what he's supposed to do. But he still finds ways to win. And the win over Jeff Neal wasn't exciting. But it was impressive. Um, I think he skated by with a win by the skin of his teeth. I don't think it was like a clear-cut win for Ian Gary. But I think in this fight... I don't know which side I want to go with because I've picked against Ian Gary in like his last three or four fights and he's come back and got the wins. It's not like I've never picked him before. I have, but in his last few, I picked against him and he's still finding ways to win. And, uh, I don't know what I want to do here. I, I really don't. I, I gave my breakdown of the fight and how I think it's going to go. Um, I'm going to go with MVP. I think he gets a, a flashy KO against Ian Gary. We've seen shades of Gary getting hit. We've seen shades of Gary getting dropped. You know, he leaves his chin there to get hit, and I think the speed of MVP is going to be too much. I know I always pick against Ian Gary. Call me whatever. Call me a hater. I am a hater, you know, but I but I respect his skill. Um, but I think Ian Gary's going to get caught with a big counter, either like a spinning elbow or that straight right hand right down the middle as he darts in. I think he's going to catch him and knock him out. Grappling would be a smart option for Ian Gary. Like I said, I think Ian Gary by submission is live. 
but I'm going to go MVP, Michael Venom Page, to get a knockout win over Ian Gary. I'll go MVP, second round knockout over Ian Machado Gary. Up next, we have a bout on short notice in the light heavyweight division between former middleweight in Roman Dolidze, or actual middleweight, taking on Anthony Lionheart Smith, who coincidentally was also a middleweight, but is coming off a brutal, well, not a brutal, but a surprising first round guillotine choke finish over a very highly touted prospect in the UFC in Vitor Petrino. Anthony Smith versus Roman Dolidze. I think it's going to be a decent fight. Um, I, I see Smith as the underdog. The favorite is Delidze. I don't necessarily think I agree with that. Um, both of these guys are decently durable, but they're kind of slow. Um, I think the speed advantage in the striking goes to Anthony Smith. I think the danger factor in the jiu-jitsu goes to Roman Delidze. Um, I know Smith is a good grappler. I know Smith got a submission over Petrino. He's gotten you know a knockout over Ryan Spann or a submission. He's gotten submissions over Devin Clark, etc. And, uh, you know, submission wins over Alexander Gustafson. I believe he submitted Vulcan Ozdemir as well, if I remember correctly. I can't remember if it was a submission or a TKO, but I think it was a sub. Um, in this fight, man, I'm not too interested in it. Originally, it was set to be Carlos Olberg versus Jamal Hill. Then Jamal Hill pulled out. Then it was going to be Olberg versus Smith. Now Olberg's out. Now it's Smith versus a short notice replacement in Roman Delidze. I honestly think this fight can go either way. I think the better fighter overall is Anthony Smith. I think he uses a better jab, uses better kicks, uses better, you know, one-twos down the middle. And he has the jiu-jitsu to fall back on. I think the better overall grappler from a grappling purist perspective is Roman Delidze. Um, on the feet, I think he has more power, but he's not as fast or as crisp as Anthony Smith. And he doesn't have the volume that Anthony Smith has. Um, I'm going to take Anthony Smith to win this one. Uh, I know I faded him in his last fight. It wouldn't surprise me if Delidze caught Smith with a big shot and knocked him out. It wouldn't surprise me if Delidze was able to wrap up Anthony Smith in a submission. But I'm going to side with the underdog in Smith here. I don't love it. I'm not saying, oh, go bet on Anthony Smith. I, I wouldn't bet this fight or touch it with a 10-foot pole in unless it was a small wager on like a specific round and specific winning method for, for either one of these guys. But I think Smith is just a little bit better everywhere, and I think he'll stay out of the danger in the jiu-jitsu and keep this mainly a striking matchup where even if he doesn't get the KO, he's going to have higher volume, he's going to use his jab, he's going to put combinations together better against Alidze who kind of just moves around and looks for one big shot, a big overhand, a big uppercut, you know, big knees in the clinch. He does have the power to hurt Anthony Smith. But I don't think he does it. I don't think he hurts him. And I think Smith just kind of sticks, gets on the stick, uses his jab, moves around well, and continues to find openings to just win this fight. Probably via a late TKO. Um, I'm going to go Anthony Lionheart Smith. Well, would it be a TKO or a decision? Uh, it is short notice. Let me think about this for a second. I'll go Anthony Smith by... I'll go second round TKO. I think he will finish uh, Roman Delidze. I think it's more of an attritional finish towards the end of round two or in round three. But I'll go second round TKO victory for Anthony Lionheart Smith. Um, again, not a fight I'm super excited about. I wouldn't tell you to bet on it, you know, but I like Smith in this one. And now we are at the co-main event of the evening. My favorite fight on the card in the featherweight division. It's a short notice bout between the number three ranked Brian T. City Ortega and I believe the number 14 ranked, 14 or 15 ranked Diego Lopez, who's coming off back to back to back first round finishes via either submission or knockout. Man, this is an amazing fight. I love everything about this fight. Even though it's on short notice, I think Ortega's coming into this fight ready to go. He looks like he's in shape. He got a really big win in his last fight after getting dropped multiple times by Yair Rodriguez, almost getting finished in the first round, you know, rolling his ankle during the introductions and kind of just offsetting the fight to begin with. But coming back, getting takedowns, looking for the arm triangle, and eventually locking up the third round arm triangle choke submission early in the third round, may I add. Diego Lopez is still kind of a question mark. Like, this guy continues to impress. I've been on the Lopez train, even as a big underdog against Movsar Evloyev. 
I liked Diego Lopez. I don't know why, because I didn't even watch tape on him before that fight. I just had a feeling, and I actually bet Lopez by submission in that fight. So I was kind of upset. <laughs> you know, you can understand why. Almost caught an arm bar, almost caught a triangle, and almost caught a knee bar in 15 minutes on short notice against one of the scariest individuals in that division. This is the first time, and I, th I find this pretty interesting, that the, this is the first time that Brian Ortega has fought somebody who can compete in the jiu-jitsu realm of his game. So, Ortega's a decent striker. He has good one-twos, can throw head kicks, you know, can throw spinning elbows like we saw against the Korean Zombie, but he's very good with his long, rangy attacks, jabs, you know, one-twos down the middle, can throw those uppercuts. But if he can keep you at range, he has decent boxing. You know, I would venture to say he has better technical striking than Diego Lopez. But the difference between Lopez and Ortega is that Lopez is just mean. He's a mean son of a bitch. Diego Lopez comes out overhands, uppercuts, in the clinch, really solid, dirty boxing, uppercuts around, uppercuts around, can catch you on just awkward angles, and the minute he touches your chin, he can put you to sleep. But the difference is if, you, if he hurts you and you panic wrestle, he can lock your neck up, he can jump for submissions, and he can submit you as well. And that's what I was going to say. This is the first time Ortega has really fought anybody who can compete in the jiu-jitsu realm of his game. He usually has an advantage in the jiu-jitsu to the point where if the striking isn't going well for him, he can resort to the wrestling, resort to finding a way to take the back, you know, resort to looking for submissions. I don't really think he's going to have that opportunity here against a fighter like Diego Lopez. I think Lopez is going to have the defensive jiu-jitsu to be able to thwart off any attempts at submissions or takedowns if Ortega gets hurt. Now, if he's on the top position, you know, in the guard of Ortega, then yes, you know, there's some trouble there, obviously. But if Ortega is in the guard of Lopez, I also think that there's trouble off the bottom from Diego Lopez. I mean, look at how quick he threw up the triangle against Devloya. Look at how quick he threw up the armbar, how fast he was able to switch to the knee bar. I mean, this guy has great jujitsu, jumped into a flying triangle against Gavin Tucker, and then, you know, switched it off into an armbar and broke his arm in the first round. You know, Diego Lopez is a marauder. I picked against him with Gavin Tucker, so I think I contradicted myself. I said I never picked against him. I picked against him with Gavin Tucker because I thought the wrestling was going to be a problem. But after that fight, in the next two fights he had, I did not pick against him. And I'm not going to pick against him here. I think Lopez is going to finish Ortega, and I think he's going to finish him early. Now, is it going to be first round? I, I honestly think yes. I think he finishes Ortega in the first round. Ortega is going to be ready. Ortega is not somebody who quits. If Ortega wins this fight, it will be late. He'll win second, third round submission, you know, something late. Just like the Yair Rodriguez fight. He's got to survive the storm and then pick it up later. But early on, I think Ortega, we've seen in the past, he can get caught. He got caught against Yair Rodriguez. You know, he was getting the, the brakes beat off him by Max Holloway. Um, he looked really good in the Korean zombie fight, so you can't hold that against him. Uh, you know, but in this fight, it's the first time Ortega's fighting somebody where his jiu-jitsu isn't going to be that huge advantage. So even if he gets clipped on the feet, he usually has option B, or should we call it option double J, for jiu-jitsu to go to in his fights. If he gets clipped and rocked, he can find a way to get into submissions and get into positions where he can threaten with submissions. I don't really think he has that option here against a fighter in Lopez who isn't the best technical striker, but has power, is very fast, very explosive, gets in your face, is, you know, right from the word go, he's ready to go, and he has jiu-jitsu to fall back on in world-class jiu-jitsu, may I add. Lopez has been finished before. He's been TKO'd, you know, on the regional scene. Brian Ortega has been TKO'd, but it wasn't a real TKO. It was an injury, and then it was a doctor stoppage in the Max Holloway fight at UFC 231. In this fight, I think this is the first time we see Ortega really get put out because of the fact that Diego Lopez has the jiu-jitsu to use once he hurts Ortega on the feet. I think he hurts him with a big shot, drops Ortega, jumps on him. Ortega goes for a scramble. Diego Lopez winds up on the top and just bombs away on him and, and finishes him in the first round again. I know first round finish is probably not the, the, the smartest pick because he's done it so many times, but I think he's going to do it again 
against a fighter in Brian Ortega. If Ortega wins, I think it's a late second or third round submission. Probably a rear naked choke, maybe a triangle, because we know how good his jiu-jitsu is. But I think Lopez is going to TKO Brian Ortega in the first round. Um, do I think he beats a guy like Ilya Teporia? I, I don't know if I'm ready to say that yet. But man, I honestly, at this point, it wouldn't surprise me. This is going to tell us a lot about where Diego Lopez ranks. But I think we also learned a lot in the Sadiq Yusuf fight, because Yusuf is one of the top guys in this division as well. And he dispatched of him quick. And we've seen Lop uh, Sadiq Yusuf get hurt, but never get put, get it put on him like that, in, in that fashion. Diego Lopez is something special, and I think it's about time people recognize that he's going to continue his winning ways against Brian Ortega. Give me Diego Lopez to defeat Brian T-City Ortega via first-round knockout at UFC 303. Now we are at the main event of the evening for the UFC Light Heavyweight Championship of the World. You have the champion in Alex Poetan Pereira taking on the former champion in Yuri Prohaska. You know, I don't know how to feel about this fight because it should go almost the same way as the first one. There hasn't been that much time between their first fight. The first one was at 295. Pereira fought one more time between that, and so did Pro Hoska, both at UFC 303 or 300. And Pereira beat Jamal Hill, first round knockout, and Pro Hoska got a beat on, destroyed for almost two rounds straight until he got that TKO later on in the second round against Alexander Rocket, showing that he can come back. And listen, I think Pro Hoska is live to get a win here. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I think he has no chance. He landed some good right hands against Alex Pereira with switching orthodox and southpaw. You know, that's just the way Yuri fights. That's why I love Yuri Prohaska. I've always been a big fan of his. Go back and listen to the podcast. I never picked against him until the Alex Pereira fight. Um, I picked against him again with Alexander Rakic. It was going the way I expected it until it wasn't anymore. Um, in this fight, I think you do have to look at one thing. Alex Pereira beat Adesanya, right? We picked him at UFC 281. He goes in, he fights Adesanya again at 287, and I picked him again, and he loses. But he almost won that fight. Even Adesanya himself said, you know, a little bit longer, if he didn't find that counter shot, it was probably going to be over. You know, so he, he found the counter, and he won, and he won by knockout. And a lot of people are coming into this fight saying, well, Pereira beat Adesanya, and then he lost, so now he beat Yuri, he's going to lose this time. I get it. It makes sense, you know, in a, in a weird logic type of way, in an MMA logic type of way. But I'm going to be honest, man. I think Pro is going to get finished again. I think he's going to get knocked out. I don't think this fight goes over three and a half rounds. I think it's it ends before the end of round four, you know. Um, I think... The leg kicks are again going to be an issue for Prohaska. But the one thing I will tell you is I saw a video of him sparring that he posted. And the guy that he used to mimic Alex Pereira did a very good job. But there's a huge difference, man. You can mimic it all you want. When you're in there with the guy who you're mimicking, it's different. And that's kind of part of the reason why I'm going to be going with Alex Pereira to win this fight again. Pereira doesn't have any telegraph on his low kicks at all. You know, sometimes he throws it out slow like the sparring partner was doing, but there's no telegraph. And he was getting clip hit with low kicks a ton by Rakic as well. The left and the right leg. He was destroying both legs. I think it's going to be similar. I think Prohaska is going to look to switch stance mid-combination, and he's going to look to time the calf kick with that straight right hand, straight, you know, or overhand right, straight right hand. He's going to look to dart in and clip him. And we've seen Pereira get hit with the straight right and the overhand right off the low kick so many times before. So if Prohaska clips him with the right hand off as he throws his low kick and he steps into it, it would not surprise me if Prohaska knocks him out. Like, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I think it would surprise me. I do think we're going to see Prohaska look to use a little bit more wrestling in this fight. He got the takedown pretty easily against Pereira and was able to hold him down. I think we're going to see something similar. To that game plan and maybe some more ground and pound looking to set up submissions. I mean, Prohaska did submit Glover Teixeira in the fifth round of their title fight at UFC 275. And that fight was insane. But I still feel like Pereira is getting better 
at a faster rate than Prohaska is getting better. I don't necessarily think Prohaska is a different fighter from the first few times we've seen him. I think he changed after the Glover Teixeira fight. You know, I think he improved his grappling and improved his wrestling. He used it more. But he's still the same fighter because that style is very hard to figure out. And it's even hard to figure out for Pereira. I mean, Pereira was getting backed up. He was getting jabbed to the body. He was getting hit with one twos. Even got clipped with a left hook in there and got pushed up against the cage. You know, but I think Pereira is kind of coming into the best version of himself. I think we saw it against Jamal Hill. And I think we're going to see it again here against Yuri Prohaska. Like I said, would I be surprised if Prohaska won? No, it wouldn't surprise me. It, it wouldn't because he landed good right hands, landed some long punches, good combinations in the first fight. So can't really be surprised here. If he gets takedowns and uses a higher level of a wrestling game in this fight, that wouldn't surprise me either. I think Prohaska is live for a submission. I think Pereira can get a sub, even though nobody expects it. I think Pereira can get a sub. Pereira locked up that guillotine, that standing guillotine, and I'm sure he's been working on his grappling, working on his jiu-jitsu. Who's to say he doesn't clip Prohaska? Prohaska goes to wrestle and he locks his neck up. It would not shock me one bit if Pereira got a submission in this fight. This guy just keeps getting better. His defense isn't the best, but neither is Prohaska's. I think this is going to be a car crash, but I think Pereira is going to control it a little bit more, and I think this fight is going to be less competitive than the first one. I think Pereira is going to chop those calf kicks. I think he's going to use some fakes and feints. I think he's going to throw that right hand a little bit more than he did in the first fight. I think he's going to find that left hook. And I think the finish is going to be similar to the last fight where Pereira or Prohaska steps in or, or tries to change stances and walks into the pocket and gets clipped with a big left hook. And I think this time there will be no doubt. You know, the last time Prohaska said it when he was done, he was out with the elbows. But I think this time it's just a big clean shot. That hits Prohaska on the chin and knocks him out. Wouldn't be surprised if Prohaska knocked out Pereira. Wouldn't be surprised if Prohaska used his grappling more, like we said, and locked up a sub. But my pick is Alex Pereira by second round knockout. I think it's going to be very similar to the last fight. I really do, but I think it's less competitive. I think Pereira controls more of the action. I think Pereira has more offense. And I think eventually he finds that left hook. It lands on the chin of Yuri, and he gets knocked out. He got hit so many times in the fight against Alexander Rakic and was able to survive and get through it. But you're forgetting the fact that he got clipped a bunch of times. You know, even though the fight with Jamal Hill, you know, didn't last very long, Pereira was pretty much controlling the majority of that fight up until the KO. And I think we're going to get another version of a Pereira like we saw at 300. I think he's going to find those openings, chop the legs, use some fakes and feints to close the distance, and then catch Prohaska coming in off a stance change when he tries to explode. <laughs> Crack him with the left hook and put him down. Give me and still Alex Poetan Pereira to defeat Yuri Prohaska via second round knockout at UFC 303 to retain his light heavyweight championship. All right, that's it for my UFC 303 predictions, analysis, breakdown, you know, fight card analysis, whatever you want to call it. I'm your host, Double M, and I'm out. You can get this podcast anywhere you get your audio podcast. I'm going to try to upload this to audio, so don't quote me on it. I know I just said it, but don't quote me on it. It's probably just going to stay on YouTube, but I might upload it to audio platforms as well. Haven't uploaded to the audio platforms in a minute. Uh, make sure to like comment, subscribe, smash the notification bell so you don't miss any of the upcoming uploads as well. Um, I'm your host, Double M, and I'm out. Have a good night, everybody, all right?